Well, thank you all for coming today and venturing out on St. Patrick's Day. I hope you're all wearing green somewhere. Um, I'm just going to um, start this with, uh, after, after Blake talks to us and stuff, if you have questions, I'll come over with the handheld mic. That way it'll be heard on the um, recording. Otherwise, they can't hear the questions. So I get to introduce this amazing man. Blake Passmore is the lead writer for the Cl Climb Glacier National Park Guidebook Series. He has a blast traveling around the park, taking photos and reaching all of these summits. Blake works as a construction superintendent for a custom home company in Northwest Montana. He and his wife are also health coaches and enjoy helping others reach their goals in life. Blake fell in love with the outdoors while climbing and hiking in the valleys of Northwestern Montana when he was a kid. Once he moved back from Eastern Montana where there are no mountains or peaks, right? In Sydney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. He discovered peak bagging in Glacier National Park. His first summit was Pollock Mountain. He does not want to summit every peak in Glacier, but there are a number of them on his bucket list. In the off season, he keeps busy riding, training for races and climbing, and doing his other full-time job. He wants to reach his 100th individual Glacier summit this year in 2022. Blake also ran his first ultra marathon, which is 33 miles, at the age of 56, and also enjoys photography, riding, fly fishing, and many other outdoor pursuits. In the spring and fall, he really likes catching big trout in Montana and Canada. So do I. Mm -hmm. Blake is married and has three adult children, two great kid-in-laws, and three spectacular granddaughters. Number four on the way oh, in July. All right, we'll have to change this. Another granddaughter. <laughs> oh, please welcome Blake Passmore. Thanks, Deb, so much. Um, it's always embarrassing to write about myself. You know how that is. So, uh, yeah, I was born and raised in Kalispell. Uh, my folks uh, were born and raised there as well. So we've got a little bit of roots in the farming community in Kalispell. And I grew up on a farm and uh, moved off of the farm when I was eight. My dad was in construction after that. So I started pounding nails with him and uh, finished high school there in Kalispell and ended up going to Montana State uh, in engineering for us for a year and came out of there with a 1.5 GPA. <sighs> yeah, it was really hard. I got, a, I got an A in fly fishing though, so that was important. And then I, I went to a private Bible college in Minneapolis where I got a history degree, a bachelor's in history, and uh, came out of there with a 3.8, so that was more my niche, I think. Went back to Montana State and got my master's degree in uh, mental health counseling. And uh, so I was employed doing uh, crisis work and, and various other types of mental health work for about 28 years. Uh, seven of those years I spent in eastern Montana in Sydney and, and fell in love with the plains. Uh, I fell in love with the people. Uh, they're just so genuine and uh, it's, there's, there's a lot more time to really build relationships over there because there's nothing to do. Um, so that was fun. Forgive me, people from Eastern Montana. I love you um, for the video. Uh, and then uh, my wife and I moved back to Kalispell where I did mental health until uh, April of last year. I, uh, I stopped working for the hospital and now I'm helping build cons uh, custom homes as their superintendent. So um, I love it. It's really fun. Uh, but uh, if I had my druthers, I'd rather just climb hike and take pictures. And that's what I want to do in a, in a few years when I'm able to retire. So I'm not looking at my phone because I'm getting text messages, but I have my notes on my phone so I can wander around. So that's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> so uh, in uh, 2010, when I started my guidebook series, I also learned about the names of all these peaks. And that's one of the things that I wanted to do was give a little bit of history about the names of the peak and who named it. So as I dug into that, I became more and more fascinated with 
the names in Glacier National Park. And I found a few books about it, especially a, a book uh, called The Place Names of Glacier National Park by Jack Holterman. Great book. Uh, but I wondered if there was more information. So I went to the park library and I, I kind of fell in that uh, proverbial hole, uh, you know, and uh, Alice in Wonderland hole where, whoa, all of a sudden it's just this whole new world. So I, I dove in and I, I, I had them look at all the archives and, and I went through manuscripts and all different kinds of stuff, just finding and taking notes and handwriting everything because we didn't have scanners back in the day. Uh, and then I... I just had these volumes of notes, and okay, what am I to do with these? So I decided to write two books, and one of them was the stories about the names along going to the Sun Road, and the other one uh, is a book about the names from Chief Mountain on the east side of the park into Many Glacier, uh, into some of the other names in St. Mary and Two Medicine, and uh, the cut bank drainage, as well as the Marias Pass area. So kind of that whole belt along the eastern front of Glacier National Park. I ended up with two volumes, and there's probably another one to write, but I'm not going to do it, uh, just because the stuff in the North Fork is much more difficult to find information on, because I don't know if the Salish people and the, the settlers there, they, they, if that historical stuff wasn't as important to them, I think probably more so to the point is nobody bothered to take that information from them. So it's really hard to find. So I wrote two books. I called it What They Called It because I thought that was a really good title. I'm trying to advance my slide. And I can't. There we go. There we are. So um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a guy named George Ostrom. Okay, so yeah, good guy. Oh yeah, Mr. Pasture Pool himself. Yeah, he does have, yeah. So I had George write a foreword for my book. He said what they called it. I found myself constantly surprised. I didn't know that. Uh, he said, I've done one hell of a job, one of a fine job digging out new and fascinating history of my park. And I think all of us feel like Glacier is my park, right? Um, has anybody never been to the park? Okay, good. Then we're all, we're all in love with the park. That's good. So Mary Roberts Reinhardt and a party was lunching along the North Fork of the Flathead River. And I, I got this, this photo from the archives up, in Cal, up at the park. And uh, she said something very interesting, and I'll, I'll read that for you. She says, why is it that with the most poetic nomenclature in the world, the Indian, one by one, the historic names of peaks, Lakes and rivers of Glacier Park are being replaced by the names of obscure government officials, professors in small universities, uh, important, unimportant people who go there to the West and memorialize themselves on government maps. Each year sees some new absurdity. What names in the world are more beautiful than going to the sun and rising wolf? Here are Almost a Dog Mountain, Two Medicine Lake, Red Eagle, a few that have survived. Every peak, every butte, every river and lake of this country has been named by the Indians. The names are beautiful and romantic. To preserve them in a government reservation is almost the only way of preserving them at all. What has happened? Look over the map of Glacier Park. The Indian names have been done away with. Majestic peaks, towering buttes are given names like this. Haystack Mountain, or Haystack Butte, Trapper Peak, Huckleberry Mountain, the Guard House, the Garden Wall. One of the most wonderful things is the Rocky Mountains is, is the Garden Wall. I wish I knew what the Indians called it. Then there are Iceberg Lake, Florence Falls, Twin Lakes, Gunsight Mountain, Split Mountain, Surprise Pass, Perro Peak. That last one was a dandy. Aller alliterative, Church Butte. Statuary Mountain, Buttercup Park. Can you imagine the inspiration of a man who found some flowery meadow between granite crags and took away from the Indian names and called it Buttercup Park? The Blackfeet are the aristocrats among the Indi American Indians. They were the buffalo hunters, and this great region once was theirs. To the mountains and the lakes of what is now Glacier Park, they attached their legends, which are, rather liter which are their literature. That's a quote from Mary Roberts Reinhardt in her book, 1916 book called Through Glacier Park. 
By the way, I've seen Buttercup Park. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So we have, trying to get my slides to move, there we go. So we have uh, some, uh, obviously the Native Americans were there way before us, white men, and uh, they had all the names as, as Mary Robert. Robert Reinhardt said, and this is Chief Two Guns White Calf, who White Calf Mountain is named for. And then uh, these are some uh, uh, Blackfeet Braves near going to the Sun Mountain. I actually found a photo of somebody that was just at that spot and took, took another photo of, of that similar uh, people standing in that location. So that was really cool to see. Of course, then we know about James Willard Schultz. Uh, he talks with the Blackfeet people. And he actually spent a lot of time with the Blackfeet and recorded their stories. That's why we have them. And he was a prolific writer, and one of his books called Signpost of Adventure contains numerous stories about the place names of Glacier National Park. Well, I just had to have that book. It was out of print. I spent about $190 to buy that book. Don't tell my wife, okay? Don't tell her, please. And then we have uh, George Bird Gunnell. And they have Lyman Sperry, who also were givers of names in the park, and, and we all kind of know who they are. Uh, so those are some other really important players. And then we have the influence of Father DeSmit. And uh, DeSmit reportedly traveled over 180,000 miles as a Catholic missionary. In the 1940s, he ministered to the Flatheads on the Jefferson River, and then he went to the Bitterroot Valley. He spent many years with the Flatheads, and other tribes of western Montana, Idaho, and Washington, and also worked with some of the Blackfeet. He knew Hugh Monroe and evidently traveled with him to some extent. Now, we, do you know who Hugh Monroe was? He is the man that is named Rising Wolf. And so Rising Wolf Mountain in Two Medicine is named for Hugh Monroe. Of course, Sinopi is his wife, and Lone Walker is his father-in-law, and those are all peaks in the Two Medicine Valley, and that's in my second book, a little teaser for you. James Willard Schultz uh, states that his writings that Monroe took to Smith to the St. Mary Lakes and that the priests erected a cross there and gave them their name. Historians wonder if it ever really stood on the lake, but he named it St. Mary Lake. That's what they say. DeSmit is remembered for his influence on the Native Americans and helping them pursue peace. So pretty influential uh, person in the, in the life of Glacier National Park. So we're going to start on the west side and kind of work our way east a little bit. And uh, these are some of my uh, photography that I've, that I've done, so uh, I hope you enjoy those as well. So that's the Aurora Borealis uh, at night uh, from near Lake McDonald Lodge. But Lake McDonald was first called, in writing anyway, in 1970, 1870, excuse me, General Alfred Terry sent a U.S. Army regiment from Fort Shaw, uh, and they ended up at uh, Lake McDonald, what it was called now, and they named it Terry Lake after him. Uh, the earliest drawn maps are from 1846 by Belgian explorer priest Father de Smit, and he refers to it as Lac de Piché. I'm not very good at pronouncing French but I think that is the name that he would have given it on the map in the 1846. There are at least three stories associated with how the name Lake McDonald got its name. Number one, and I'm going to take a vote to see who you think which one it should be right. Number one, in 1878, Duncan McDonald uh, was running supplies to Canada, and he, uh, he and a group of Salish camped at Terry Lake, and uh, years later, people would see, they saw a tree with the name McDonald carved in it and uh, into it while they visited the village of Apgar, and ev evidently the lake became known as McDonald's Lake. Eventually, the name changed over to the, the current name that it is in Lake McDonald. That's number one. Was it Duncan McDonald, or was it Sir John McDonald, who reportedly crossed the border and blazed a trail to the lake? He carved his name on the tree and claimed to discover the lake. I don't know when that happened. And number three, in 1933, Superintendent E.T. Schoyen received a letter from Mr. Whips of Kalispell, Joe McDonald, about Joe McDonald, who lived in Columbia Falls in 1888. And he said that uh, sick Joe McDonald lived up by the uh, lake, and he was a trapper, and uh, 
he just had tuberculosis, and uh, so he would come into Columbia Falls with his pelts every year, and because he lived there, that they just called it McDonald or Lake McDonald. So which one? Think one, two, or three. Which one's more credible? Which one? Number two. The first one, yeah, I, I don't know. So you can pick your your favorite and just go with that. Um, he also Scoyan also said that in the early times, trappers did not know that the lake had been named Terry Lake years earlier, and they naturally began calling it Lake McDonald, not because of the man, sick Joe McDonald, but because he, McDonald, happened to live there and trap there. So that might be the, uh, another one. Schultz called, uh, wrote that uh, the Lake McDonald was possibly the place that the Kootenai people called place of dancing. On an interesting note, though, that Schultz also states that the Kootenai slid down Baby Glacier when they were having their sacred dance. Baby Glacier is very close to Bowman Lake. In his work, Man in Glacier, C.W. Buchholz wrote that Schultz was not correct and that the Kootenai festivals were probably at Lake Pond Array in the present-day North Idaho. Either way, it's a good name for that place. Uh, according to Elo Vat, another historian, and he was an attorney that lived, uh, visited Apgar a lot, he said it was called the Big Lake in the Mountains. So that's kind of the history about all of those places, all of those names associated with, with Glacier, with, with Lake McDonald. Um, so that is a little bit of this green stuff up, oops, oops, this green stuff right up here. That's called sky glow, and that's something that's a very natural phenomenon. It's, it's similar to the aurora borealis, but it happens year long, which is really cool. And that was the first time I ever captured that on film, so I thought that was super cool as a photographer. So this is Little Chief Mountain, and now we're going to jump across the Continental Divide. Schultz wrote that Little Chief was part of the small robes clan of the Pegan branch of the Blackfeet Nation. Uh, the namesake of Little Chief Mountain, it's 9,541 feet tall, was accidentally killed around 1865 when his horse fell and he was trampled to death by stampeding buffalo. Uh, Father DeSmit wrote of a conversation he had with Little Chief while they were traveling to Fort Lewis on September 25th, 1846. Little Chief had a dilemma and he described it to Father DeSmit this way. A chief of the blood tribe had murdered a Nez Perce who was under my protection. To avoid being dishonored, Little Chief immediately attempted to kill the chief, but only wounded him. Little Chief told DeSmit that soon he would be seeing his enemy. And after hearing DeSmit's word about forgiveness, he had a different heart and wanted to make peace with his enemy. He had decided to try to make peace, but if the other party refused, he would have no choice but to kill him. DeSmit wrote that when they arrived, the other chief's heart was full of vengeance. DeSmit spoke to the blood chief about the purpose of little chief's visit and encouraged the other chief to forgive. At the end of his conversation, the blood chief stated that all was forgotten and how could his heart be bad after the black robe's words. Little chief embraced his former enemy and then presented his enemy with a horse and a beautiful robe. Then they smoked a peace pipe to forge the agreement. Isn't that a neat story? That is great. Isn't that a great story about that mountain? So that's one of the ones that I want to climb this year. That's one of the ones on my list. Now we're at St. Mary Lake, still on that other side. I love St. Mary Lake. It's one of the most beautiful places to, to shoot photography. I'm sure you all like it too. St. Mary Lake had a few names since, the, since man first started traveling along its shoreline. George Burnell grew wrote uh, in 1885 in the Forest and Stream magazine article that the Blackfeet knew it as Lakes Inside or the Walled In Lakes. It was also called Windmaker Lake, of course, the legendary wind over there, so that makes sense. The Kootenays called it Old Woman Lake. The St. Mary River was called Lakes Inside River. So inside the walls of the mountains, that's where that came from. Father DeSmit is credited with naming the lake St. Mary Lake, and the Native Americans translated the name to be Good Spirit Lake. It is recorded that Jack Monroe, or Rising Wolf, discovered, discovered the lake of St. Mary in 1836. He also reportedly took Father DeSmit to the lake in the fall of 1845, 
while in the presence of the Kootenays, Monroe erected a cross along the shoreline of the lake. We, I kind of already talked about that story a little bit. Does anybody have questions so far? Okay, we'll keep rolling. So now we're going to jump back across to Avalanche Lake and Gorge. So um, everybody's hiked to Avalanche Gorge and Avalanche Lake probably in here. You never have? No, I'm not a hiker. You're not a hiker? Well, because you're not a hiker, I'm going to give you a book. Okay? That's one of my books, okay, that I, I just brought up, okay? All right. So uh, in the past, Avalanche was known as Avalanche Camp. You guys remember Avalanche Camp. That's, we used to go there with my grandparents and have picnics. It was awesome. Uh, in 1894, the Lyman B. Sperry Party attempted to reach the glacier basin above Avalanche Lake, only to be turned back due to the difficult terrain. Can you imagine climbing up the rim of that thing on the back here? Um, other associated names included Royal Gorge for the Avalanche Gorge and Glacier Lake and Lost Lake for Avalanche Lake. Today, Lost Lake, they renamed, they did another one, is over by Sun Point. Of course, that's one that's all protected. You can't swim in it because it has this rare plant in it, which is super cool. There's only two places in the world that that plant occurs, and one of them is there in Glacier. Avalanche Basin was called Beaverhead Basin by the Kootenai, and snow slide on the mountain, or snow slide basin on the mountains. Schultz called the lake Beaverhead Lake, and the creek was Beaverhead Creek. That's interesting. And Sperry's party of six, led by Frank Gadoon, a mountain named after him, reached the lake after an arduous journey through tangled brush and deep forests. They camped on the shore of the lake on June 3rd of 1895. The area was named Avalanche because of the number of avalanches seen both, both seen and heard during their stay. Sperry also wrote in July of the same year, a trail was cut from Lake McDonald to Avalanche Lake. An expenditure of $75 was provided by a Mr. Whitney of St. Paul, Minnesota. Sperry expected to be the first party to use the completed trail in August, but Mrs. Mr. J.H. Edwards and his wife beat them to the lake by a few hours. Edwards is the guy who Edwards Mountains is named after. They beat him to the lake by a few hours. So he did all the work, and somebody else took the credit. That's awesome. And uh, she became the first woman to ever see the lake, Mrs. Edwards did. A year later, the Sperry party returned and actually reached the Sperry Glacier Basin via the Snyder Lake Basin, which is on the other side of the ridge. Um, the Sperry Party named the number of peaks on their first visit to the lake. They, also, they called the peaks surrounding Avalanche Lake Sphinx, the Dome, the Castle, and Cathedral Spire. Obviously, those names didn't take in Glacier, but I think that would have been super cool. I think probably the Little Matterhorn, which is here, was probably the Cathedral Spire, I would think. That would be what I would think. That's what I would want to name it. So Stanton Mountain uh, is on over above Lake McDonald, and this is a 45-minute star trail that I shot uh, over, uh, over the mountain from the lake. This was last winter. Uh, Stanton Mountain was called Thunder Traveling Over the Mountain. This was a suggested name uh, by Schultz, and uh, the name of Thunder Traveling Over the Mountain that refers to the courageous leader of the Nez Perce, Chief Joseph. That was his name. So how cool would have that been to have that name, Thunder Traveling Over the Mountain? Stanton Mountain is easy to recognize from any point along the southeast shore of Lake McDonald. The peak is named for Lottie Stanton, the wife of a stable owner in DeMarsville by Kalispell. Uh, and at it, it, one time it was called Lottie Stanton. That's interesting, isn't it? L.O. Vaught wrote that in 1891, Lottie was part of a group that visited Frank Gadoon at the head of the Lake McDonald. Two men decided to set out and climb present-day Stanton Mountain from a low notch on the ridge. So they basically kind of went up the Trout Creek Trail and went up the normal route. Uh, quite a while later, Lottie Stanton decided she was going to beat the two men to the top and chose a much steeper and shorter line. It is said when the men arrived, Lottie Stanton was waiting for them on the summit. 
The notoriety of the Stanton family is evidenced by many places that bear the name Stanton Glacier, Glacier, located near Great Northern Mountain. A hiking trail also leads to Stanton Lake, a very popular hiking destination along Highway 2. So quite an influential uh, family name. The Snyder Lake Basin, uh, I love the story about this one. Uh, There's a gentleman named George Snyder uh, who settled near the head of Lake McDonald and built the very first hotel there. And it was called the Snyder Hotel in 1895. He also put in the first power boat on the lake, a steamboat named the F.I. Whitney that he charged, that he used to carry passengers to his hotel. In 1906, ownership of the hotel changed to John and Oliver Lewis, and Snyder's influence uh, provided names to Snyder Creek, which comes right down there by Lake McDonald Lodge, uh, which, and uh, Snyder Lakes up on the basin between Edwards Mountain and Mount Brown. Sperry gave the names the name Horseshoe Basin to the Snyder Basin instead. Um, Callis Bell historian John Fraley and Deb, you need to get a hold of John Fraley and have him come talk. Okay. He's brilliant. He's from Callis Bell. I'll, I'll connect you with him. Um, Callis Bell historian John Fraley referred to Snyder as the Glacier Park Maverick. Snyder had continual skirmishes with the National Park Service over concession licenses and lands. After his boats were seized in 1919, Snyder filed a lawsuit for illegal seizure of private property and won a suit of $1,500 against the government. In 1921, he bought a touring car intent on competing with the park's registered concessionaires. This went well until 1923 when Snyder was charged with reckless driving. George moved out of the park, and in the 1930s, he and a partner started a small but fruitless gold rush down in the Middle Fork, and he later moved to Kalispell. By 1940, Snyder was in his 70s and fell ill, injuring himself badly enough to warrant sending him to the state mental hospital at Warm Springs, where he died in 1944. He was homeless and didn't have a penny to his name. Fraley wrote, Snyder left a huge mark on the park but he was never accepted by the Park Service. A host of bureaucrats and army of government lawyers had tried for years to evict him from the park. They finally succeeded, but George left a bigger mark on Glacier than all of them combined. Well said, Mr. Fraley. Now the cool story about the rest of this, this is the uh, little antidote. John Fraley is the kind of guy, in his research, he found George's grave site down at Warm Springs, because. He couldn't afford a a grave, and he bought a headstone and put it on there. That's the kind of man my friend John Fraley is. He's a good man. That's pretty cool. The Little Matterhorn is up in the Sperry Glacier Basin. Remember I pointed that sucker out from the bottom? Well, that's what it actually looks like. That's why I think it might be Citadel Peak. A Little Matterhorn is 7,886 feet. That's one of my targets this year as well. Um, it can be seen from a few places along the shoreline of Lake McDonald as you're driving up along going to the Sun Road. It char- rises sharply on all sides, forming a striking spire that reminds viewers of the Matterhorn of European fame. The Little Matterhorn uh, can obviously be seen from Avalanche Lake and from the Sm- Snyder Lake basins. It has been called Como's Horn because for Dennis Como, who was a guide, uh, he actually took uh, the Clements couple up to the top of Clements, no, sorry, up to Can- the Cannons up to the top of Mount Cannon on their honeymoon. We'll talk about that. Well, I won't talk about that. That's in the book. And it's also been called Mount Kalispell. So it's pretty interesting. Did you know that? Nope. I didn't either. <laughs> then we have McPartland. Okay, we have, this is Heaven's Peak. Okay, but I'm going to talk about McPartland Mountain a little bit first. McPartland Mountain, which is over to the left out of this view. Uh, No, actually, sorry. That's McPartland right there. This is taken from the the summit of Mount Vought. So I'm looking to the north. Uh, McPartland Mountain is named for Frank McPartland, who drowned in front of the Lake McDonald Lodge in 1895. This is quite a story, too. He was in a boat with Libby Collins, the cattle queen of Montana, Cattle Queen Creek is named for her along the High Line, and, uh, and her, her brother Chan. An argument broke out over a jug of whiskey, and somehow McPartland capsized the boat. Chan hung onto the boat, and Libby and McPartland struggled in the water. He had a hold of her cloak. 
Twice they sank below the surface due to McPartland being weighed down by a mining pick, a revolver, and ammunition. Finally, Libby released the cloak and McPartland sunk to the bottom of the lake. Libby Partland was said to weigh about 300 pounds and rescuers had to tow her to shore with a rope tied under her armpits. Who knew that, right? That's cool. So then the, so the proposed name for McPartland is Crossing Over Victor Mountain. So celebrating something, that's what the Native Americans would want to say about that mountain. And uh, then Redbird Mountain uh, was a name provided by Schultz for the park icon Heaven's Peak. Uh, Jack Holterman wrote that the Blackfeet called it the Maker Where He Lives Mountain. And I love that. Heaven's Peak, the maker where he lives mountain. But then started, stated that he was not aware that Heaven's Peak was all that sacred to the Blackfeet people. The official name was perhaps given by a prospector named Dutch Louis Meyer, Dutch Creek, up in the park, probably named for him. And uh, other documents in the map prepared in 1888 by Lieutenant George Ahern noted that the peak was called Heaven's Peak. Heaven's Peak is a mountain that almost everyone can easily identify because of the big sign at the loop. And I'm not going to read the rest of that because you've probably all seen it. Okay. And then, of course, we're to Bird Woman Falls. Who thinks they know the story and why Bird Woman Falls is named Bird Woman Falls? Who do you think Bird Woman was? Anybody have any ideas? Everybody thinks it's Sacagawea, because they called her Bird Woman, okay? But it's not named after Sacagawea. It's, uh, Bird Woman was a wife of one of the influential Blackfeet chiefs. So, um, so that is the, that's the story behind Bird Woman. But it, most people think it's, oh, for Sacagawea. Uh, it was actually called Oberlin Falls at one point as well. Uh, of course, Oberlin Mountain is on the left, and named for Oberlin College, one of those insignificant historical professors that came to the park that wanted to get their name on everything. So, you know, we're, we're going back to Susan Reinhardt, uh, Roberts Reinhardt about that. So that's kind of the story on, uh, on Bird Woman Falls. And then we have Logan Pass. And this image is from uh, working up my way up Oberlin Mountain, or Mount Oberlin, excuse me. And uh, I found it very fascinating um, that... Uh, the Blackfeet called it packs pulled up. So when, when they'd come up on the west side, coming up over the pass, it was so steep, and they would do it in the wintertime, that they literally had to use ropes to pull their packs up. So that's why they called it packs pulled up. And when they got in the other side, they would get on their packs and ride them down on the snow. And that's how they went over that. And I actually spoke to a, a Blackfeet friend of mine, and she said, we still call it that. So that's really cool. And they also called it the ancient road. Now, I found also a little bit that, you, you know, that this little area in here is called the Hanging Gardens, right? The Blackfeet called it Bigfoot was shot here. And I'm going, what? Bigfoot? They used to have caribou in the park. And they shot caribou up there. Isn't that amazing? You would never think of caribou being in Glacier Park nowadays. But back in the 1800s and 1700s, they were. So I, I found that really, really, really interesting. Now, I don't have a picture of, uh, of that, so I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to go to the Garden Wall. Um, and Did anybody know the story of how the Garden Wall got, got named? Really? Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to tell you that. So the Garden Wall is an aret that's formed by two glaciers, each on the opposite side, picking away the rocks. That's what an arete is. And it makes up a spectacular section of peaks the, uh, uh, by Logan Pass all the way down to Swift Current Pass. The name originally was applied to the many glacier side of the Continental Divide, but both sides of the ridge are truly spectacular. I wrote that it was named by a George Bird Grinnell party in the 1890s when they were at Grinnell Lake, in the Many Glacier area, they were singing a popular song named Over the Garden Wall, and one of the party members remarked, there is one wall we cannot get over, and the name was given to that spectacular wall. So the song goes, over the garden wall, 
that love is forever. Um, I can't sing it all because I don't remember the words, but it's a very, really cool song. I had it on my computer, but I can't play it. So there you go. I'm sorry. But it was a very popular song, and I actually found the song. It was like, I can imagine sitting around a campfire singing that song and singing Kumbaya and all their other stuff that they would sing, you know, rather than being on their cell phones, you know, when they're out camping or having their boom boxes going. I mean, it's amazing. You meet these people with their little boom boxes going and walking down the trail and disturbing my peace, you know. Uh, yeah, that's, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox. So that's the garden wall, and the bishop's cap sits on top of that garden wall. And, of course, the bishop's cap uh, is named uh, for a familiar hat or of the Roman Catholic bishops or abbots wear. Um, from the east side, the distance of the summit of bishop's cap to the valley floor below there is about 2,700 feet drop down. And uh, the, the bishop's cap's really cool because it's probably an area like from here over to where Deb is on the top, but it slopes like that. I don't know if you've ever been up there. Uh, but it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, my little baby girl wants me to take her up there, but not this year because she's pregnant, so I can't take her. She's going to have to wait another year. So that's Bishop's Cap. It looks almost impossible to climb, doesn't it? So this is Fort McKenzie, and uh, anybody, or Fort Union, excuse me. Anybody ever been to Fort Union on the eastern side of... Uh, the, of, of Montana. Pretty amazing place, isn't it? Have you been there when they shot the cannon off? Pretty amazing. It's uh, right by the confluence of the Yellowstone and the Missouri River at the, at the Montana-North Dakota border, over by Sydney, just north of Fairview, Montana. The question was, where is it? So that's, that's, that's where it's at. Really cool place in Fort Union, has an influence on the next two stories I'm going to tell you. So that's why I showed it to you. So Reynolds Mountain uh, is called Little Water White Man Mountain. That's what the Blackfeet called it. So the park records indicate that this mountain was named by George, Brunel, George Bird Grinnell for a member of his forest and stream staff. Another one of those guys that, why, Right? But it's an amazing mountain. Schultz wrote that the peak should be called Little Water White Man Mountain for Kenneth McKenzie. McKenzie and his partners built Fort Union near the confluence of the Yellowstone and Missouri Rivers on the border between North Dakota and Montana. He was respected by the Blackfeet because of his treatment of them was so kindly and generous they had no little respect and affection for him. So he was a good man that founded that place. So that's why they named it, that's why they wanted to name it that. And then we have Clements Mountain. And it was named, needed to be named Beaver Child Mountain. So it was named by Ross Carter for Walter M. Clements. He was one of the commissioners who negotiated with the Blackfeet and, and helped sign the treaty of the federal government to purchase the seeded strip. Does everybody know what the seeded strip was? So the street, seeded strip basically <clears throat> is everything on the eastern side of the Continental Divide between there and the current Blackfeet boundary. So the Blackfeet signed this treaty um, called the, uh, to, and gave up the seeded strip for certain, like one and a half million dollars or something back in the day, which was a lot of money. Um, and uh, so, but he, Clements was one of the ones that helped sign or get that um, treaty signed. I need a drink of water here. George, or Schultz says that Clements Mountain should be named Beaver Child Mountain for Alexander Culbertson. He was in charge of the fur trade for the Upper Missouri River Basin for the American Fur Company. Culbertson took the post in 1836 after Kenneth McKenzie retired, so he was in charge of Fort Union. The Blackfeet called him Beaver Child, so that's that. McKenzie fell in love, oh, sorry, um, Clements, Culbertson fell in love with a Native American girl, <coughs> and he said, I want to marry her, and the chief said,
He said, I want to marry her. And uh, the chief told him that uh, he, he said, you can marry her next year, but you need to prove yourself. So uh, she came back a year later, and he made himself good. And uh, the chief gave him her, her hand in marriage. Her name was Sacred Snake Woman. That'd be a pretty exciting, I'd be married to Sacred Snake Woman. And uh, Culbertson begged the year earlier in vain to marry her at once, but two sons said, I, have, I am not of two minds, two tongues, because he speak English and the Blackfeet. I have told you the condition upon which my daughter, you may have my daughter, and I keep my word. To keep his word, two sons returned the next summer and brought an entire tribe with him for the wedding. Sacred Snake Woman arrived on a black buffalo runner, and she gave Culbertson along with 14 white horses. Beaver Child had gifts for her as well, as well as her parents. He gave her father and mother weapons, ammunitions, and other trade items. He also gave Sacred Snake Woman beautiful clothing and jewelry, as well as a new red gown made of silk. After he left the room, she dressed in that red silk gown, and they celebrated the feast in her honor. Schultz wrote, so, many, so began a happy union that lasted until she died many years later when visiting her blood relatives. During the mid-1890s, mid isn't that a wonderful story? In the mid-19th century, there were more than 150 glaciers in, 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 in the park. And this one right up here, oops, this one right up there is a remnant of one that was called Museum Glacier. So things you find out. We're almost done, folks. Going to the Sun Mountain, of course, we all know that. It's supposedly named by James Willard Schultz after this big romantic Indian legend about Napi going up there to the mountains and all that. Uh, James Willard Schultz uh, said later that uh, he was teasing. It never had any Indian, native, Indian legend associated with it at all. So uh, just those, those things you kind of find out, you know, as you're, as you're researching. Uh, Matapi, the next one, the one right next to it, on the other side of this, the Native Americans in the wintertime, in the, in the spring, they could see a face, in the, so they called it Face Mountain. And you can see that above the Bering Creek Valley. So this is what Schultz said. I myself named Going to the Sun Mountain simply because of its imposing uplifting into the blue. There's no engine legend in connection with this name, James Willard Schultz. We're going to skip to Bering Creek or Sunriff Gorge. Uh, Sunriff Gorge was called Jeanette Gorge. I don't know who Jeanette was. If you, could, if you can find that out, let me know. Um, and then uh, it's about 200 feet long and about four feet deep. So it's, it looks like there's a lot of water, water running through there, but the stream is only about four feet deep. Someday I want to go through that. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, it's also been called Bering Creek Gorge. And L.O. Vaught wrote that no name was provided for this unique gourd, but later, some later beholder struggled mightily in an vapid effort to poetically describe had tacked onto the name Sun Rift Gorge. Now, isn't that funny? Here we go again. Vaught suggested that every feature in this valley have consistent names. He even went on to suggest that Matapi Peak be named Bering Point, Sexton Glacier be, be named Bering Glacier, and Sun Rift Gorge be, called, be named Bering Creek Gorge. Two more slides left. Wild Goose Island. Um, I've heard lots and lots of stories about Wild Goose Island, about two Native American uh, lovers that met there and then they disappeared. They flew off into the, you know, in, in the, into the sunshine and, and all that. I don't know what's true. I've, uh, it's a really neat spot. I've also been told that this is the very best place to take a picture of, of, uh, of Wild Goose Island. I was, literally, I was camped there with my tripod and uh, somebody, a Japanese lady came and, and literally put her tripod like right here. She said, this is the best place to take a picture. And I go, oh, great. Well, I'm in the right spot then. So I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, according to Elo Vat, Wild Goose Island was originally named Not Os Api Island by James Willard Schultz. Schultz gave this name while providing guiding service to the Bering brother, Brothers, Bering Creek, um, in 1886. He wrote that the meaning was old or son, old man. Vaught wrote that this was a queer name for an island, but at least it's original and better than Stony Island, Pine Island, or some other common name. 
Wild Goose Island Pull-Off is a very popular place for photographers. The island has been a nesting site for geese for many years, so that's probably why it was named Wild Goose Island. And lastly, uh, two dog flats. Um, that's the Big Dipper over Single Shot Mountain. Um, the occasionally, it's occasionally possible to see elk grazing in the meadows at Two Dog Flats. Two Dog Flats is believed to be the campsite of the Emerson Brown group of Texan prospectors who mined for gold near Quartz Creek in 1876. Some people say they discovered gold. I'm sure glad that didn't get out, right? Two Dog Jack was a local resident who did a lot of cross-country skiing. His English name was Jack Harp. Two Dog Jack was featured in the May 1911 Travel Magazine article by R.H. Sargent. Sargent referred to him as a character, a man of many experiences with rod and gun. That's what this is named for. Now, gentlemen, wouldn't you want to be known as a man with many experiences with rod and gun? I mean, that's a pretty good tag, isn't it? I am done writing. That is what the other book looks like. Uh, they're both on for sale in the bookstore. Uh, this is the other one that uh, I have a few more copies, so if you'd like one of those, let me know. I'll just, just give them away. Um, and uh, this is my climbing guidebook series. I've written five books, and they total about 100 different routes up 100 different mountains. Um, and my, I and my team have climbed all of those and taken pictures, so it's like a dummy's guide to climbing and glacier. There's pictures and lines drawn on them and, and all of that, so it was a lot of fun. You can kind of see my insanity a little bit through that, though, I think. And uh, what questions do you guys have? I'll try to answer them. Don't, let the microphone... Don't be shy. I do have a question. Okay. Wild Goose Island, the photograph, I didn't see an island. <laughs> Am I the only one that didn't Let's see Let's go back it? there. Right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a little tiny island. Yeah. Now, last summer, I went and I stood up on this point, kind of bushwhacked down in there, and it's really long, which you can't tell, and it's pretty narrow. It's, it looked like a battleship cutting through the... Uh, through the the, the waves and stuff. It was pretty amazing. Yes? I was really interested in your photo of the yard wall that you were showing from your Nell, above the Nell Glacier. Right. The Salamander and the Jam by the Platte. And the story about Grinnell and his party having named it. Of course, today we think of the garden wall for the most part, uh, if you're touring the park, as being above Sun Road on the other right. side, yep. south, looking yep. down south. So I will take that back to Minnie Glacier with me. I'll keep it in my head. Yeah. So the comment was about uh, the actual naming of the garden wall, how it happened from the east side, yes. not on the, not on the uh, west side of the, or sorry, north versus south side of the Continental Divide. And that image was actually taken from uh, the top of Haystack, or sorry, not Haystack, on the, from the top of Angel Wing, or you're near that. Yep, yep, yep. That's a pretty cool climb. So, yeah. any other questions? How high was uh, the first the first uh, mountain you scaled? How high was it? Uh, Pollard. Pollock. Uh, I think it's about ninety six hundred feet. So, yeah. No it, technical. No, n n actually, none of the stuff I do is ropes. I don't like ropes. I like just, I just free climb stuff. I just asked him if all his climbs were technical climbs. Yeah. Yeah. There's only six technical peaks in the park, and I haven't done any of those. I'm going to do Wilbur this year. Any other questions? Thank well, you so very you're much. Welcome. That was that was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Uh, you know, I love the park. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, Unfortunately, there's a lot of things going on, as we were talking about earlier, you know, with the new ticket system and all those kinds of things. So it's, it's getting more difficult to visit that place that we all love so much. So um, just go there, get through the gate before 6, okay, in the morning, or go after 5. And a little secret for local, if you go in the evening and head up about 5 o'clock, there's nobody there. 
So that's when you go to Logan Pass is in the evening. So that's a little, little local insider tip for you. So, okay. all right, thank you so much. Blake is going to be out in the lobby um, um, signing books. The books are for sale in the bookstore. So, um, and if you want to just sit and chat with him, I'm sure that he wouldn't mind that at all. I don't mind at all. <laughs>